Good, um, good afternoon. My name is Ibrahim Kaloko. Um, my concern is um, to the gentleman from uh, Farm Africa and the, the lady from DFID. Um, as far as I know, most of the systems of agriculture, um, the gentleman from Farm Africa was kind of talking on, these are things that have been in existence for over the ages. And looking at what is happening in Africa, irrespective of all the efforts, all the energy that's been put in place with most NGOs, including Farm Africa, yet Africa has been characterized as the poorest and the most food insecure continent in the world. Um, based on these premises, it is very clear that whatever approaches we are using, these approaches are not workable. Um, some years back, uh, a Catholic priest in Madagascar introduced a system of uh, agriculture that is now called conservation agriculture. With conservation agriculture, it is a system of agriculture that is using less input with greater productivity. I want to know what are the stands of Farm Africa and DFID on conservation agriculture in terms of moving Africa from food insecurity, malnutrition, and poverty. Okay, thank you very much. I think we had a question over here. Um, I'll just hand the mic out if anyone's got a question. <laughs> here. Okay. Anybody else? Over here? Hi, I'm Jerry Boyle. Um, I'll just give a very um, straightforward question to Steve Wiggins, which is perhaps to expand on what you mean by uh, processes, not forms, and perhaps to give us a bit more flavor about which processes you mean and how would you characterize them? Um, if there are no other questions just yet, um, would somebody on the panel like to address the, the question from over there, the, the techniques from Madagascar and perhaps why after s so many years the, the approaches out to Africa seem not to have worked. Um, who would like to take that? Iris, go on. Thank you. Um, specifically on conservation agriculture, um, I, I would resist somehow um, agreeing with your statement that across Africa certain approaches haven't worked. Africa is such a huge continent and it's so varied, especially agroecologically, that um, I, I just can't handle. I, I can't respond to that. And the same, I would say, applies to conservation agriculture. In some areas, it is a great solution. Um, and, and farmers are taking up a lot of, of, of ag conservation agriculture. For example, in Zimbabwe, we're working with lots of smallholders on that, or in the larger southern Africa. Um, at the same time, we I remember programs um, that we funded through NGOs where farmers were not so keen. And the simple reason is you just have to have enough land to um, to, to use ag conservation agriculture as a method, and you have to be able to not have a great harvest for a couple years um, until you get there, until you have converted. And uh, in some areas where farmers have very little land and they need to they need to farm them as much as possible, they just don't think that's the way for them to go. In other areas, for example, southern Africa, where you have more land. Um, um, there is a lot, the adoption rate is a lot higher, but we agree. This is something that where the local conditions are enabling and there is, there farmers would easily um, um, adopt it and keep it going and not drop it after two, three, four years. This is certainly a solution. Um, I think George and Josephine want to jump in there just very quickly so we can get some more questions in. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, speaking f for uh, Farm Africa about conservation agriculture, we, we are neither for nor against it. I think it's, it's really horses for courses. Um, and in some places where access to purchased inputs is very unreliable or low, I would say we do work with our farmers to practice what you might call some kind of variant of conservation agriculture, which is based on the principles of low purchased inputs. Um, I'd be interested to know exactly what the Madagascan version of conservation agriculture is, because sometimes it can involve quite a high input of 
of pesticides, sorry, not pesticides, herbicides, uh, because you've got no tillage techniques. You, you may, the, the questioner may be thinking of a different kind of conservation agriculture, perhaps involving, it's SRI, system for yeah. rice. Sure, surely it's the system, system for, for rice, for rice, rice intensification. intensification. Yeah. Catholic priest yeah. Madagascar. Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. if it's just. Yeah, it's 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 you see a lot of it in Asia as well, and we don't do much work in rice. But I, I would just say that we're neither for nor against it. We do whatever we think, uh, whatever our farmers want to do, as, as Iris has made the point, and um, whatever we think I is going to help them, and and we we help them, you know, gain the knowledge and and decide what they want to do, etc. I would also echo Iris's uh, thoughts that um, that. Africa is, you know, it's changing. I mean, there are a lot of success going on in agriculture. There's no question of it. Um, and although, you know, as Iris says, it's a vast continent, but there are, to use Iris' phrase again, islands of success, and hopefully these islands can grow and coalesce and eventually cover the ocean. Um, I, 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 s I see a lot of good stuff happening. Thanks, Martin. Um, Josephine, did you want to jump in? Because you did allude um, in, in a way to to the thrust of that question about loads of aid being pumped into Africa and yet we don't seem to have seen uh, much result. Yeah, I, I think he just reiterated, sorry, reiterated what I highlighted, but in response to him from the private sector where Africa should move, I think we shouldn't advocate for one farming system for all. If it's conservation or uh, in our seed language you say organic farming it works for some crops then conventional farming should be promoted and biotechnology which is controversial but i think all farming systems should be promoted depending on the market demand and also agroecological zone so that we have a robust and private a robust private sector that can come with a different kind of innovation. I won't go for one. Obviously, the mushroom grower would do great with organic or maybe uh, some other uh, uh, tree crops, but uh, it depends on the agroecology. Agro if you come along the equator where temperatures are always between 25 to, 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 to 20, nine degrees centigrade and it's so comfortable for all of us all the insects love it too so how are you going to do your conservation your crops will totally be wiped out by pest so somehow you need either conventional or biotechnology thank you yeah so question over here can, can the, uh, mark can, uh, can, Brian, can, can i make one more point on that yep. just really very quickly um the science research about SRI is very uneven, by the way, just to be totally frank. It's not clear that SRI works better than the other system. And it's a huge debate in the literature uh, to the point where it's divided in essentially the two camps, which is 99.1% that it doesn't work and 0.9% that it does work. And I'm curious, as Josephine was saying it's not one system. Evergreen agriculture puts enough nitrogen to triple the yield of maize anywhere in Africa in three years with no other inputs. And it turns out Fiderbia does not compete during the rainy season, it drops its leaves. And in the dry season, it puts its leaves on. So the idea that we're going to have one solution. And then we ought to look at the soil library at ICRAF, which has 250,000 acquisitions from across Africa that have been ground truth. So if you have an agricultural system, you ought to understand your soil as well as possible. And very soon, all those analysis will be able to be done by satellite. They've cracked the system finally. And you'll be able to say, I have this area, it's only good to 10 meters square but I have this area, can you give me any information? And that could all be done from telephony. It, you won't even have to have direct access. So the advent of agriculture that's from the first industrial world to the third industrial world is happening very quick. But I am concerned, and I'm happy to s 
see that Josephine met, mentioned it, every aspect of agriculture must be considered. You, you can't have a single model that you hold on to uh, and raise the flag for constantly. Everything has a place in the system. Thanks, Dave. Um, two questions over here. <coughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, Brian Heap, uh, Cambridge. Uh, Biosciences for Farming in Africa, B4FA, which you may have seen our website and our weekly output from that. Uh, I have a question about communication and, one a, and a question about duplication. The communication has to do with this question of the role of extension agents in African countries. We work in two West African and two East African countries, and it's become increasingly clear the weaknesses that exist in the government systems and the growing strengths that seem to be appearing in the private sector. And we've been interested particularly that uh, over the last few months we've uh, had 160 journalists who are now media fellows with us for the next six months. And a high proportion of these people are farmers as well as journalists and they form an extraordinary linkage between the farmers and the source of knowledge, the universities and the institutes and so on. And so I, th I, I think it's fascinating to see how there are new methods developing and particularly if this could be extended to the training of women so that they're not advised by male extension agents, that would be a huge step in the right direction, I suspect. Uh, that's to do with communication. My question in relation to duplication, uh, I think it's terrific that DFIDIP and our country is putting so much money into African countries. I do a lot of work uh, with the European Commission and it worries me sometimes about duplication because the Commission have a huge, huge investment in uh, impact in assessment, for example, with some very sophisticated work going on. That's just one example. And I wonder to what extent these things are harmonized. Great. Um, behind you. Thank you. Uh, James Copestake from the University of, of Bath. Uh, and a question, I think, chiefly for Josephine. Uh, <coughs> you mentioned in your list of, uh, of, of things that helped uh, the Victoria Street Company to grow um, regulation. And I'd be interested if you could share any stories of how you were successful in bringing civil servants on side to help you and build trust. Uh, and um, maybe going beyond some uh, recollections about that, you also talked about moving from national markets to uh, international markets and what experiences you've had of trying to um, promote or extend, expand your seed production to, to neighboring countries. Why don't we start with Josephine and then perhaps Iris, you can take up the issue of duplication. Yeah, I, the role of extension agents, I would be happy to learn because for us from Uganda, I think for lack of a better word, I would say government has abdicated its responsibility in undertaking extension, although we have the National Agricultural Advisory Services, it has been completely politicized. And I remember in the last elections, you get the candidates of uh, certain parties coming to pick seed and then I wonder if really that is the kind of extension that works. So I think I would be happy to learn from you and maybe we could replicate it. And that is why I mentioned in the very beginning that development partners need to focus more on what I would call the missing middle, the businesses that drive demand and add value. Because we can provide extension but because we do it with our profit, we are limited. You can only do as much as the profit you make. So if we had that extra funding that it's going to government that is not probably not very keen on doing what they should do, maybe the private sector should be engaged and they, they know if an informed farmer is a market, so they will invest in it. Then on, what was I saying? Regulation. I'm not sure if I came out. What I meant was to have a well-functioning agricultural input market, we, want, we need a strong regulatory framework. So for an emerging market like Uganda, you need some kind of regulation. For a developed market, I'm more informed about the US one, AOSA, the, you don't need 
any kind of regulation. The farmers know what good quality seed is. The seed company uh, staff or technical team, they know how to inspect. They know how to, 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 to certify. They know how the whole quality system is well developed. But in an emerging market like Uganda, where we don't have a, a developed quality system, we ourselves need human capital and to, to make sure that we get quality seed into the marketplace. So if you have a government body like ours, National Seed Certification Service, that when you want your crop to be inspected, they don't have money, when will they come? Sometimes they come when we are harvesting. They should have inspected it during active growth before flowering. They come after flowering and they issue a certificate. So when it's not there, it's a challenge. And also when somebody is faking your seed and you report to them, they have to apply for funding and it takes like a week. And even the law, they are, there is a seed, uh, seed act and statute, but there is no regulation for it. The guy gets locked up in the police for like three days. He's released. Then he goes back to faking. So to us, we have always requested our government to come up with uh, a separate body and make a national seed certification services autonomous. Actually, Kenya has a very good um, case, KEFIS. It's very efficient. It may sound tough but it forces the industry to come up with very high quality inputs. If you can't meet the standards, you get out. Then as the industry grows, time comes when you need to reduce on the regulation because everybody knows what it takes to certify. The seed company has in-house capacity. So that is what I meant by having strong regulation for an emerging market. But it doesn't, it has to be different. Other markets need to, to perhaps have less regulation if it's developed. And then on top of global competitiveness, uh, I was still on, she took away the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a second question on global competitiveness. Well, for our company providing inputs, I think you are aware seed is the most regulated product all over the world. So I just can't send my seed crop from here to to, to from, from Uganda to, to the UK, for example. But we do try to trade regionally. We had this uh, harmonization project uh, uh, championed by ASAREKA, Association for Strengthening Agricultural Research in Eastern Central Africa, where we harmonize our seed standards and requirements for importation so that seeds could move across borders. We minimize our diseases so now if uh, like I have a, a new product, a new maize hybrid, if I've already released it in Kenya and Tanzania, they should only allow it for one season in Uganda and they use the data in the country and get it released. So it was basically to improve trade in the region. But thinking of that global trade, seriously, when I look at Africa's agroecology, I should be trading with Brazil and Argentina. I'm sure my varieties would grow there. But with all this, that's when I speak of globally com being globally competitive. So how can you even think of getting across to South America if you cannot grow in your own market? So we need a business-friendly policy and also development partners like DFID. We appreciate your work, but uh, for your information, do you know the aid freeze is actually hitting the private sector, not the government? So. Some, some of the projects that we could have done, like value addition, it has been suspended. I can't do it. And it's, uh, I'm sure government doesn't give a hoot. But those farmers you see there, I need to give them a market. So I can't do it. So I think we shouldn't really be punished for the corruption of our government. There has to be a way where the private sector should be included and that is very specific that's to so th that's and that's why i accepted to come <laughs> there's, <laughs> <that address. laughs> there's two questions for you uh yeah iris uh, uh duplication and aid hurting aid cutting cut off hurting private sector rather than the government may, may, maybe we'll do the second one first <laughs> and then, then after that steve can answer the question on processes which i forgot earlier great which is um, why i tried to take the mic away from you 
Yeah, just as background for Uganda, our, our aid freeze has nothing to do with us running out of money or other reasons or reprioritization. It's just a, an automatic result of our zero corruption policy. And until that case is resolved, I'd rather leave it at that. <laughs> I would take note of, of, of the fact that that hits the private sector, and that's certainly known. Um, but when, when suspicions come up, that's an automatic stop to start with. And then, of course, discussions start in order not to undermine outcomes and, and, and what we want to achieve. Can we use alternative channels for the same finance? But you will appreciate that once such a process has kicked off, it takes some a bit of yeah. time to redirect because if we redirect immediately, that might also be quite di difficult before we have actually carried out an investigation. Um, you asked about a very, very good question. So many donors and uh, many want to do their own programs, so they'll do bilateral programs and uh, don't they overlap, don't they duplicate? Um, I'm always impressed, and I've, have, I've worked for a donor for only two and a half years before I worked for a large NGO, and I was an NGO <coughs> representative in a donor group. Um, I've always thought they, they must overlap, and they're doing the whole thing many times. Um, but at national level, there are usually even sectoral donor groups, and they know really well what everybody's doing. And very often from that, they come together and then say, why don't the three of us get together and, and launch a program because we have joint interests or we are working in this region. So that's, that's good. Um, there are also global donor. You have, we have the global donor platform on agriculture and rural development. We have... Um, donor groups that, that rotate. Um, we have regional donor groups, especially also at the <coughs> EU level, and I just happen to be the DFID member in the EU group um, of Heads in Agriculture and Rural Development. Um, so at that level, we exchange a lot of information as well, and as DFID specifically, we work very closely with the EU, not just to influence what they do and how they do things, um, but also to, to see that our work is synergetic and complementary and doesn't overlap with the new EU um, food security implementation plan for 2014 and 2020, that's even going to be stronger because that will contain a commitment towards better coordination plus joint programming and joint reporting where this makes sense, um, both of the Commission and its member states. So that's something that if it's implemented as it currently stands, and we assume everything has been approved by now, um, then this will even make for stronger, not just in terms of um, coordination and regular meetings, it will make for joint reporting on what has happened, either in, in, in uh, synergized programs or in joint programs. Thank you. S Steve, do you want to address the question of processes? Sure. Uh, Jerry Boyle asked the question, you know, tell us a little bit more about these processes which you've got up there as, the, as, as your prime lesson. Um, yeah, these are learning processes. Uh, we're, we're talking about facilitation of processes which are those of trial and error where things go through phases. Now, you can, you can use generic terms like that, but one of the case studies in here is, is potato growers in Kabali district in southwest Uganda. And that's a story that goes back to initially uh, Africa and uh, CEPT, Colombia actually, <laughs> working, working with local groups of farmers to produce better potatoes as seed potatoes for what at one point was a buoyant market for seed potatoes, yeah? But then the seed potato market gets saturated. So the next thing is the opportunity, which apparently aro arose more by serendipity than planning, to link up those farmers to Nando's restaurants in Kampala, which at the time were thinking of, of all things, importing frozen chips, yeah? So you then get the system linked up to Nando's, but Nando's then says, you know, we, we need a, a particular kind of potato, a size of potato, so then you're back to the agronomist saying, well, how do we make sure we get that? The answer is in fertilization, and Nando says, we don't want one delivery a year, of course, we need regular deliveries every, every now and again. So then the farmers are drawing up production schedules, and they're getting into using swamplands and irrigation to try and grow potatoes in the off-season. There's a subsequent uh, story about this where the relationship with Nando starts, starts, to, starts to go downhill mm -hmm. and some of these elements get unraveled. But this is the nature of, of, of such things. It's going through, through phases. Um, 
yeah, and drawing on different forms of activities to confront different challenges as they arise. It's six o'clock, um, so it's going to be time for nibbles and refreshments. But is is there anyone with a burning question? Yes, I recognise you. <laughs> You're going to come up with a provocative question, aren't you? <laughs> uh, I'm Anthony Elman, an agricultural consultant. It's really a follow-up to, to, to the last discussion on processes and what Steve said. Uh, I thought you talked initially about contract farming a bit dismissively, I thought, that, that it can only affect a small minority of yeah. growers. Um, but if we, we're looking to, at ways of integrating small-scale producers into commercial supply chains, <coughs> there needs to be some kind of agreement between the buyers and sellers. You, this Nando potato buying example is, is, is one. Um, but I think that there is a need for a contract, a, uh, formal or semi-formal, specifying the roles of each side, each party to the agreement, and ensuring that they stick to the rules. Because otherwise, there's such a there are so many examples of farmers being ripped off, or companies investing in expanded processing capacity, and then not getting the raw, raw materials. Um, there can be the downside, of course, if farmers get locked into an unfair agreement. But that's where the facilitator that you talked of uh, comes in, an NGO acting as a marriage broker between the buyers and the sellers. I think that it's a form which has more potential than, than you suggested in your talk. Um, person next to you. <coughs> Guy <coughs> Poulter from the Natural Resources Institute, NRI. Just briefly, I wanted to come back to the extension issue, which I think is um, absolutely key to the future of um, smallholder farmers. And I totally agree with this uh, idea that um, you know we want to put the efforts in to take subsistence farmers into small commercial farmers. But this idea that we're ever going to get back, even if it was the case 20, 30 years ago, where we did, ha we did have a good government extension services, the idea to me that for sort of mostly in Africa that we're ever going to get back to that, I think is um, not a very um, uh, <coughs> likely idea. And But I think what we need to look for is the innovative idea, innovative ways of producing, coming back to extension services. And I guess the examples that we have on the panel I is the work of Mars, for example, in terms of working with the cocoa farmers and yourselves with the seed industry and in fact Farm Africa with their um, veterinary medicines. I just wonder whether the panel had any views on where we might be going or how we can go to improve extension services on the premise that actually governments aren't going to be there to provide those services in the future. Steve, do you want to take the one about contract farmers? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't actually mean to, to denigrate uh, contract farming so much as to set it in context, okay. yes? Because sure. the, liter the, the, the literature on contract farming is that if you read one part of the literature, you say this is absolutely marvellous and an answer to almost every, every problem we've got there. And then you're faced with the reality that what percentage of, of small farmers actually get contracts. And while some of that, and it, you know, the answer to that is a very small fraction indeed. And then you say, well, some of that may be simply because somebody hasn't set up the contracts that would, the, the, that would satisfy it. But in a lot of cases, you probably come to the conclusion contracting might not work, um, be the best answer here. Uh, so I didn't, I, I, you know, where contracting works, wonderful. I, I just wanted to put a, a counterpoint to some of the literature that suggests that if you have contract farming, you've, you've probably solved this particular problem. Um, I'm give the word over to Howard and then Josephine on extension workers and then I think uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. Yeah, I would just like to mention one thing about duplication effort. Why are we worried about duplication effort? The need is so vast and when you're trying to think through those problems, I welcome every single chocolate manufacturer in the world to join in with us and work like hell at everywhere in West Africa where cocoa is grown. Why, why, there, there's no problem with duplication effort. 
You may say the governments are duplicitous in their duplication of efforts, but that's a different story. Now, on extension agents, I think there's two, two facts. You cannot simply, and I understand the, the problem that Josephine talked about in Uganda, abandon most extension services. If we just throw our hands up and say it's going to go to private industry and people start to do it, it just won't work. In the case of Cote d'Ivoire, the case of Ghana, the case of Nigeria, are they as good as you would want them to be? Probably not. Uh, but we have been training them with them on cacao. We flew some 40 of them to uh, Indonesia to learn how we had cracked most of the problems that they're involved with. And they came back really quite enthusiastic, and it's working. The other thing that happens on a community level is training of entrepreneurs who want to be these people, who want to sell inputs, who want to sell tools, who want to sell budwood or seed from you know, from s other sources, those people we call cocoa doctors in Indonesia. They're just called CDCs or CBCs, meaning the village center, the cocoa village center. Someone is supported to start that with small loans, and then they become an expert, and they give the information to their community and the communities around. And if they aren't good, you can be sure, as, as Josephine and others have said, the farmers will reject them and seek other information. But to simply abandon the national services won't work. And you have to as well build regional capabilities beyond the end of the road where many rural farmers operate and only motorcycles commute to, not big trucks and not <coughs> Toyota Land Cruisers and things like that. So this mixture, uh, public and private, must be robust for it to really succeed. Yeah, Howard had taken the words out of my mouth. I, I would just uh, emphasize what he's saying, exactly that. It depends on, on the market. I think 85% of our farmers are on smallholders, less than two acres. And really, without a very strong private sector, it's very costly to go to all these little farmers. That is why government has a role until gradually they are all commercialized into their producer organization, marketing groups, then gradually most of that responsibility for extension should pass to the private sector. And they really need to focus on strengthening the private sector for that to be achieved. But I think uh, Howard has summarized it well. Uh, we've overrun, so uh, I'll just say a few last words. Um, thank you very much for the to the panelists for giving us such a wide and rich array of views. I think it's interesting that um, agriculture is such a prominent topic of discussion now after being out of fashion for so long without much investment going on into it and now we have as Iris mentioned the L'Aquila Accords we have various international ini initiatives the Maputo <coughs> Accord where African governments are committed, commit, are committed to putting 10% of GDP into agriculture so uh, perhaps uh, agriculture's time has come again and perhaps not too soon Anyway, thank you to the panelists and thank you to you all for coming and for your questions. Thank you. <laughs>